Good day, friends, Romans, and countrymen. Today, we, the Group 5, will help you unlock and discover hidden truths about Philippine curriculum and its foundations. Now, why is it necessary for a person to know the history of something? Bakit pinagpipilitan ba sa atin na malaman ang kasaysayan ng isang bagay? Tulad na lamang ng panliligaw, kinakailangan mong makilala ng lubusan kung ano ang mga naganap sa nakaraan sa buhay ng iyong nililigawan. Bakit? Para mas makilala mong lubusan ang taong iyon. Gayun din sa Philippine Curriculum. We need to know what is the foundations, what is the history of Philippine Curriculum for us to know and appreciate the Philippine Curriculum that we have today, which is the K-12. Now, let's go back to our lecture. We, the Group 5, will discuss to you the ancient period where education was easy as ABC. Their focus was on vocational skills, katulad ng pagtutroso, pangingisda, pagsasaka, at iba pa. Pre-Spanish and the Spanish period where the religious content or the religious aspect of education was deeply emphasized to each person during that period. The American period where patriotism, nationalism, and other nationalistic values were emphasized in the Philippine curriculum. The Japanese period where Nipongo or Nihongo was taught to each student for them to communicate with Japanese people. That's the nature of our discussion for today. I hope that each hearer and viewer will enjoy the educational information that we will deliver to you through this video lecture. Oh hi! Today, we are going to discuss about the educational phenomena during the ancient period. What the curriculum was about during the ancient period in the Philippines. Like many nations today, the Philippines eventually adopted the 28-letter Latin alphabet, which is the A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. But before, we had our distinctive alphabet, which is the Baybayin. Before today, the number of letters in the Filipino alphabet varied, given that we first had a pre-Hispanic Baybayin. Then, for a hundred years of using the Latin alphabet, and with many regional languages influencing the way Filipinos write. Early in the pre-colonial period, the ancient people of the Philippines did not have any writing system, and so, they relied on oral tradition in recording folklore and folk history. The educational system of the Philippines during the Spanish times was found. The religious congregations paved the way in establishing schools from the primary level to the tertiary level of education. The schools focused on the Christian doctrines. There was a separate school for boys and girls. The wealthy Filipinos or the ilustrados were accommodated in the schools. Colonial education brought more non-beneficial effects to the Filipinos. There was also Educational Decree 1863, the first educational system for students in the country. This decree was established by virtue of the Education Decree of 1863. In furtherance, the decree required the government to provide school institutions for boys and girls in every town. As a consequence, the Spanish schools started accepting Filipino students. 
It was during this time when the intellectual Filipinos engaged. The normal school was also established, which gave men the opportunity to study a three-year teacher education for the primary level. So, have you learned a lot? Truly, Spanish education played a major role in that transformation. The oldest universities, colleges, vocational schools, and the modern public education system in Asia were created during the colonial period. And by the time Spain was replaced by the United States, the colonial power, Filipinos were among the most educated subjects in all of Asia. That's all for the education curriculum during the Spanish era. Gracias! The American brought many changes in their 45 years of reign in the country. Until now, these influences can still be seen in our way of life. The Commonwealth provided free education in public schools all over the country in accordance with the 1935 Constitution. Education also emphasized nationalism, so the students were taught about the life of the Filipino heroes. Vocational education and some household activities like sewing, cooking, and farming were also given importance. Good manners and discipline were also taught to the students. The Institute of Private Educational Goal during the American period is to promote democratic ideals and way of life, formation of good citizens, including the rights and responsibilities of people. The Education Act of 1901 laid the foundation of the Philippine public school system. In August 1901, 600 teachers, or called Thomasites, arrived. English was made medium of instruction. The curricular structure and programs were patterned from the U.S. There were three levels of education, which are elementary level, secondary or high school level, and college or tertiary level. There were also new subject areas that were introduced. Religion was not included in the curriculum of the schools. Normal, vocational, agricultural, and business schools were also opened. Schools were also built in non-Catholic areas like in Sulu, Mindanao, and in Mountain Province. Education under American colonization led to a widespread Americanization of the Philippines. Through education, Americans had influenced many Filipinos in terms of what they like, eat, culture, and demand on westernized products and lifestyle. During the American period, there were also benefits and anticipated outcomes. The first one, the spread of providing public education. It is known that U.S. spread headed more aggressively the provision and delivery of schooling paid by public coffers to unheard of areas of the archipelago. During the U.S. occupation, it became fashionable to go to elementary and high school and for the same to go to college. This generally introduced the hazy idea behind spreading enlightenment to the majority of the populace which up to now continues. The second one is the introduction of the concept of press freedom, which still continues in the country through not a few journalists and media practitioners have died in the course of duty lately. Consequently, and up to now, there is particularly no other country, at least Asia, that may be described as having a free media than what can be seen in the Philippines. The third one is a continuation on putting too much value on elitism among its leaders plus their influential relatives although not spoken loudly in most sectors of society. The fourth one, 
The collaborative and dependent tendencies of the national Philippine government with the U.S. government in certain areas of governance have always been noted and observed, especially viewed by outsider. The Philippines continues to be a solid ally of the U.S. in Asia in many years, even up to these days, which gives some people strong ideas that it's still colony up to now. Fifth, most American cultural effects continue to be felt and followed in practically the whole Philippines. This goes on practically in all fields, from the use of English, which an official language as mandated in this constitution, the distribution of US-made movies and TV shows in all media circuits, the tunes of music played, latest fashion styles, and etc. Lastly, and up to a certain extent, the U.S. occupation had opened up gateways for some other religions to be extensively introduced to the Philippines, most particularly the many brands of Protestantism. The impact of the said occupation may soon dissipate, even before most of us interested viewers may have the luxury of time to notice it. The educational system in the Philippines had undergone various stages of development. These stages of educational evolution can be traced way back from the pre-Spanish period to the Spanish period, to the American period, to the Commonwealth, and to the Japanese period going to the present. According to the history, the Philippine education had manifested in the culture by the people. However, there are no definite records that were available showing the types of school that established by the natives as well as the subjects and the methods that they use. Let's go to the brief history of Philippine education during the Japanese period. Pearl Harbor was attacked by the air fleet of Japan. Ten hours later, the Philippines was invaded by Japan. The Japanese occupation happened in 1942 to 1945. The Empire of Japan occupied the Commonwealth of the Philippines during World War II. In the year 1942, the Military Order No. 2 was established. Japanese educational policies were embodied in the Military Order No. 2. Philippine Executive Commission established the Commission Education, Health, and Public Welfare. Schools were reopened in June 1942 with 300,000 students. The Deputy People consulted included experts, public and private school teachers, the 16 regional directors, 145 superintendents, at least 20,000 principals, and representative teachers of the different subject areas in different year levels. The Philippine Commission on Educational Reforms, or the PCER, created on December 7, 1998, through Executive Order No. 46, recommended the adoption of the restructured BEC and its implementation starting 2002. The BEC focuses on the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, science, and patriotism. Values is integral to all the subject areas. Students can then be ready for lifelong learning. It seeks to cure the inability of students who cannot read with comprehension at grade 3 and worse, at grade 6. The BEC decongests the overcrowded curriculum. Integrative and interactive teaching. These are characterized by group learning and sharing of knowledge and experiences between teachers, between teachers and students, and among students. For instance, under the old curriculum, English teachers prepared lesson plans for English and values teachers prepared for values education. Under the BEC, the English and values education teachers work together on their lesson plans. Now, high school math shifts from the spiral system which introduced all math subjects in every level to the linear. Sequential approach where only elementary algebra is taught in first year, intermediate algebra in the second year, and geometry in third year. Now, the 2002 basic education curriculum was also makabayan, makatao, 
makakalikasan at makajos. That means the common values of Filipinos was also emphasized in implementing this curriculum. And the learning is also assessed using variety of measures. Integrative teaching methods such as thematic teaching, content-based instruction, focusing inquiry, and generic competency model was also used in beautifying the curriculum. The results of national and international assessments were reviewed and analyzed for their implications for teaching and learning process. The findings were used to further tighten the standards and improve the delivery of the curriculum and the teaching learning process. The results of the evaluation of the implementation of the 2002 basic education curriculum were likewise considered in the review of the curriculum. The findings and recommendations guided the training of teachers and the capability building of school heads in managing the pilot test of the curriculum in 23 secondary schools nationwide. The SEC or the Secondary Education Curriculum also has three stages. Stage 1, or the results or desired outcomes, which define what students should be able to know and do at the end of the program, course, or unit of study. Generally, expressed in terms of overall goals and specifically defined in terms of content and performance standards. The content standards of the Stage 1, which specify the essential knowledge, skills, and habits of mind that should be taught and learned. They answer the question, what should students know and be able to do through this curriculum? Performance standards, which express the degree or quality of proficiency that students are expected to demonstrate in relation to the content standards. They answer the question, how well must students do their work? Or at what level of performance would a student be appropriately qualified or certified in doing a certain task? Another important part of the stage 1 of SEC is the essential understandings, which are the big and enduring ideas at the heart of the discipline, and which we want the children to remember even long after they leave school. Another part of the SEC stage 1 is the essential questions which are open-ended, provocative questions that spark thinking and further inquiry into the essential meanings and understandings of a matter or a subject matter. And finally, curriculum objectives, which are expressed in terms of knowledge and skills that teachers can use as guide in formulating their own classroom objectives. People often assess or evaluate everything they do in life for them to know what is the end result or the effects it brings to their lives. That's why, just like in this curriculum, assessment is very important. Assessment, which defines acceptable evidence of students' attainment of desired results, determines authentic performance tasks that the student is expected to do to demonstrate the desired understandings and defines the criteria against which the student's performance or products shall be judged. Products and performances, which are the evidence of students' learning and a demonstration of their conceptual understanding, content, and skill acquisition. Just like in our regional courts, a case without evidence or proof will be considered irrelevant. Just like the learning of the student, it must have a evidence or a proof for the evaluators to know if the curriculum has succeeded or failed. The learning plan, which is the last stage of SEC. The learning plan which details the instructional activities that students will go through to attain the standards. Instructional activities which are aligned with the standards and are designed to promote attainment of desired results. As conclusion to the BEC and the SEC, it yearns for one learner or one Filipino student to attain maximum intuition, maximum cognition, and maximum understanding of the whole curriculum. Because no curriculum will seek for a student to know nothing. It will always seek for the student to attain greater heights for him to have academic advancement. 
that is also one of the corollaries of educators, implementers, curriculum designers, curriculum planners, curriculum evaluators, and the DepEd itself is to advance the academic structure of Philippine education. Expounding the thought of modern curriculum, the expansion in the availability of education was not always accompanied by qualitative improvements. Therefore, quality became a major concern in the 1970s and early 1980s. Data for the 1970s show significant differences in literacy for different regions of the country and between rural and urban areas. Western Mindanao region, for example, had a literacy rate of 65% as compared with 90% for Central Luzon and 95% for Metro Manila. A survey of elementary school graduates taken in the mid-1970s indicated that many of the respondents had failed to absorb much of the required coursework and revealed major deficiencies in reading, mathematics, and language. Performance was poorest among respondents from Mindanao and only somewhat better for those from the Visayan Islands. Other data revealed a direct relationship between literacy levels, educational attainment, and incidence of poverty. As a rule, Families with incomes below the poverty line could not afford to educate their children beyond elementary school. Programs aimed at improving work, productivity, and family income could alleviate some of the problems in education, such as the high dropout rates that reflected at least in part family and work needs. Other problems such as poor teacher performance reflected overcrowded classrooms lack of particular language skills, and low wages. These problems, in return, resulted in poor student performance and high repeater rates and required direct action. In 1990, the education system offered six years of elementary instruction followed by four years of high school. Children entered primary school at the age of seven. Instruction was bilingual in Filipino and English although it was often claimed that English was being slighted. Before independence in 1946, all instruction was in English. Since then, the national language, which is Filipino, has been increasingly emphasized. The Enhanced K-12 Basic Education Program Now, what is K-12? K-12 means kindergarten and the 12 years of elementary and secondary education. Kindergarten refers to the five-year-old cohort that takes a standardized kinder curriculum. Elementary education refers to primary schooling that involves six or seven years of education. Secondary education refers to high school. The K-12 Education Vision Graduates of Enhanced K-12 Basic Education Program will Acquire Mastery of Basic Competencies be more emotionally mature, be socially aware, proactive, involved in public and civic affairs, be adequately prepared for the world of work or entrepreneurship or higher education, be legally employable with potential for better earnings, be globally competitive, and every graduate of the enhanced K-12 basic education program is an empowered individual who has learned through a program that is rooted on sound educational principles and geared towards excellence. The foundations for learning throughout life, the competence to engage in work and be productive, the ability to coexist in fruitful harmony with local and global communities, the capability to engage in autonomous critical thinking, and the capacity to transform others and oneself. That is the vision of K-12. These are the features of K-642. Number 1. Kindergarten and 12 years of quality basic education is a right of every Filipino. Therefore, they must be and will be provided by government and will be free. Number 2. Those who go through the 12-year cycle will get an elementary diploma for 6 years, a junior high school diploma for 4 years, and a senior high school diploma for two years. Number three, a full 12 years of basic education will eventually be required for entry into tertiary level education. 
entering freshman by school year 2018-2019. What is senior high school? Senior high school is two years of in-depth specialization for students depending on the occupation, career track they wish to pursue, skills and competencies relevant to the job market. The two years of senior high school intend to provide time for students to consolidate acquired academic skills and competencies. And lastly, the curriculum will allow specializations in science and technology, music and arts, agriculture and fisheries, sports, business, and entrepreneurship. Now, I will present to you answers on the question, why do we need to add two more years of education in our curriculum? Here are the answers. To decongest and enhance the basic education curriculum and to provide better quality education for all. We all know that the Philippines is the only remaining country in Asia with a 10-year basic education program. K-12 is not new. The proposal to extend the basic education dates back to 1925. Studies in the Philippines have shown that an additional year for schooling increases earnings by 7.5%. Studies validate that improvements in the quality of education will increase the GDP growth by 2% to 2.2%. Minus 2 instead of plus 2 for those families who cannot afford a college education but still wish to have their children find a good paying job. Right now, parents spend for at least 4 years of college to have an employable child. In our model, parents will not pay for 2 years of basic education that will give them an employable child. In effect, we are saving parents 2 years of expenses. The plan is not plus 2 years before graduation but minus 2 years before work to inspire a shift in attitude that completion of high school education is more than just preparation for college but can be sufficient for gainful employment or career. Now, the conclusion of everything. Each academic phase, curriculum period did play a great part in making the curriculum we have today. Kung hindi po sila nagsikap sa paggawa ng magandang curriculum in the past, we will never appreciate, we will never have the greatness, the effectiveness, and the efficiency of our curriculum today. That is why we as future educators must know the holistic definition, the holistic description, the holistic knowledge of the curriculum for us to appreciate and be curriculum makers, curriculum planners, and designers in the future for the benefit of our society. We must also remember that curriculum is a part of education, and without the improvement, the innovation of education, the nation will not be as progressive, as economically growing as it is. That is why we, as students, as part of the society, must help in curriculum change, curriculum innovation, and curriculum improvement for the betterment of our nation, for the betterment of our world.